Hello there. Aren't you brave venturing this deep into our dark little corner of the internet? So uh, in celebration of your achievement, we're proud to bring you another episode of The Countless Corpses, an Omen Publications show and home of the best signal in show business, The Stab Signal. That's right. Yeah. I am... <laughs> I am the Dark Lord Nemesis and your host for this evening. And as always, I'm honored to be joined by the hardest working man in the slashing business, Macab Mike. How you doing, Macab Mike? Yeah, baby. All right. So, this episode, we will be covering 2009's reboot of the Friday the 13th franchise, ingeniously named Friday the 13th. <laughs> uh, it was meant to be a remake of the original Friday the 13th, but. It combined elements of the first four films in the series. What emerged was a much more polished film that, for my money, morphed into something much different than other entries in the series. Not that that's a bad thing. Uh, I found it really hard, though, to put my finger on the pulse of this movie, and we all know how I like to get my hands on someone's pulse. So, uh, <laughs> I am, though, really curious to see what you thought of this movie, Macabre One, as you are the Friday the 13th aficionado in this group. And don't say we don't spend money on this show, folks. I really had to strain the budget to come up with that sweet-ass word, aficionado. It just rolls <laughs> off the tongue like a six-day-old caviar. I mean, it's beautiful. <laughs> In the meantime, I want to hand off the mic to my co-host, Macabre Mike. Welcome to the show, man. Why don't you intro the stab? I mean, literally, not figuratively. Put that knife down for now, bro. And why don't you introduce yourself to everyone before we get into this thing? Aw, oh, man, don't tease me like that. Nice, nice. <laughs> Seriously, though, uh, this movie grew on me as I watched it more and more. And watching the two-part documentary, Crystal Lake documentaries, didn't hurt either. Uh, the 2009 reboot definitely has a different feel than the rest of the franchise. Uh, but I like it. Uh, it brings the franchise into a modern setting. Amalgamates parts 2, 3 in the final chapter. And I kind of like the survivalist Jason protecting his territory take on the man that would be the silent but deadly. Uh, honestly, I don't know how they could have accomplished those things uh, in another way. I, I, I don't know. What do you think about that, Dark Lord? I get it. You know, I get it. And if I'm being honest, I dig it. A boy, his knife, in the camp where his mother died. I mean, it's pure American nostalgia there. And let's be honest, the only difference between this movie and, say, an 80s classic like Red Dawn are the American flags and the prospect of World War III. We put Jason in that situation and he's a national fucking treasure. Am I right? Right. Uh, so, um, but yeah, let's break this thing down. So why don't you start us off on pre-production, man? And let's get into this movie. Actually, on that note, I mean, if you think about it, um, <laughs> Freddy Krueger is a child molester and a child killer. And we celebrated him. He was a fucking child's toy. Little kids dressing up as him for Halloween and shit. I mean, goddamn. If we can do that to Freddy, I think we can do that for Jason. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> all right, though. Let's dive in. Platinum Dunes, Michael Bay, Brad Fuller, and An Andrew Form, who had made the 2003 and 2006 reboot T Texas Chainsaw Massacre films, uh, were brought on as producers uh, for the 2009 reboot. But it took them over a year to obtain the film rights from Paramount Pictures, New Line, and Friday the 13th creator Sean S. Cunningham's Crystal Lake Entertainment. You see, Paramount, as you know, has been a part of Friday the 13th from the beginning, and all of the footage from the first eight films and the remake rights for the first film remain the property of Paramount. Jason Voorhees, Pamela Voorhees, Crystal Lake, and the name Friday the 13th, however, have belonged to New Line since the early 90s, after the commercial flop of Jason Takes Manhattan. Platinum Dunes producers wanted to be able to use the scenarios and characters from the film still owned by Paramount, and of course, New Line's Jason Voorhees Pamela Voorhees, Crystal Lake, and the name Friday the 13th. 
There was a legal dispute at first, but the companies decided to co-produce the 2009 film so that neither of them would look bad uh, for not being part of the film if it, if it was a success, which was a big part of the dispute. You know, neither of them necessarily wanted to put their foot in, in, into the whole thing, but neither one of them wanted to look bad by not being a part of it if they didn't. So I, I guess that's why they came to that decision. Now, Bay, Form, and Fuller had made both the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films and the 2005 Amityville horror remakes period pieces set in the past. But since the new Friday the 13th film was not going to be a remake, then there was no reason that the setting for the film could not be in the 2000s instead of the early 80s. And I have to say that I like the modern setting for the film. If I want the classics, they are right there for me to watch. Let's see something new, is what I say. But as I understand it, Michael Bay, Brad Brad Fuller and Andrew Form chose a familiar face as the director of the film, didn't they, Dark Lord? Absolutely. But uh, first off, while I will say that it was strange to see Friday the 13th modernized, once it got going, I really got into the film. So I got to give it to him. So uh, you are also correct, though, that they did choose a familiar face to direct the movie, Marcus Nispel. Uh, this was director Marcus Nispel's second remake of a classic horror film. Uh, his first remake was 2003's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which was also produced by Platinum Dunes. As a general rule, I do I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of remakes with some notable exceptions, Rob Zombie's Halloween being one of them. I also have to add that I have never seen any version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, if you can believe that. It just never appealed to me. Growing up near the Mojave Desert, I figured... I could see a real-life version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre of the film anytime I wanted by venturing deep <laughs> enough into the desert. So I missed out on those films. <laughs> you know, um, just as a little side note, our mutual friend Steve Sellers, who, yes. who lived in Texas for quite a bit of for for quite a bit of time there, uh, said that the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, the original, felt very authentic just to give it an extra level of creepiness. <laughs> if you said something there, I didn't hear it. No, I was just laughing, but uh, I have oh. to say that uh, Steve saying it feels authentic is, is a, not a great selling point for Texas. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I personally love the reboots of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre way more than I like the original two Texas Chainsaw films. I could not even finish the first film. I made wow. it 50 minutes in, and that was it. That was as far as I could go. I could not see no more. And the second film was just fucking weird. It wasn't scary at all. It was just weirdness uh, th there was nothing in it for me there but but i have watched the 2003 and the 2006 films many times and i love them there's plenty to be scared of in those films they come with my personal recommendation dark lord very cool very cool perhaps i will check them out someday though the question is would you personally recommend a lone trip out into the mojave desert now that's the question <laughs> no no i would not <laughs> But a lot of problems get solved out in the desert. Yes, they do. <laughs> and they get left out in the desert, too. But uh, uh, yeah. enough that, about that, was, that was a casino reference, by the way. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of holes out in the desert. Great movie, <laughs> yeah. Casino, by the way. That's a freaking <laughs> outstanding movie. Uh, yeah. Let's see. But enough about my cheery upbringing, though, uh, <laughs> with the Mojave Desert and all the holes out there. Uh, let's get back to pre production. So, Co-writers Damian Shannon and Mark Swift were both involved with the conclusion of the original Friday the 13th series and were at the writing helm for the start of the new one with this reboot. This added some needed continuity, and I think you could see that they understood the assignment here. I mean, coincidentally, I do have to say their first produced script was 2003's Freddy vs. Jason, and I will say that is one of my favorite horror movies from both of those franchises. So uh, I'm a huge fan of that movie. <laughs> Uh, but based on their experience writing Freddy vs. Jason, Shannon and Swift imposed some rules on themselves when they set out to write the script for this film. First, they wanted the teenage characters to sound normal. And I dig that, especially after we're coming off uh, other movies that had uh, preceded it. Shannon and Swift wanted to avoid the Scooby-Doo trope where a bunch of kids go off sleuthing as they seek to solve the mystery of their friends getting hacked and slashed for our entertainment. Well, oh, Shaggy, Jason's coming to kill us, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's fair. 
Uh, I mean, I know that if a bunch of my friends got gutted by a freaky mofo like Jason, intellectualism would go out the fucking window, and I would be cursing like a horny sailor with the clap as I fought for my life. So I <laughs> fuck out of there. Uh, but on that note, not the just a horny sailor, but a horny sailor with the clap. Like, God yeah. damn, that's a swearing motherfucker. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm not fucking running away. Uh, but on that note, the writers wanted the kids to speak in a normal manner and not to be in possession of knowledge that they would otherwise not know. And I know that's another thing that we overlook in horror movies, but it is, you got to do some serious disbelief to not know. It's like, these guys know fucking everything that's going on. So... On that note, though, there's only one kid in this movie who has got it early, by the way. I mean, he's fucking the first one to go. Only that one kid knows the name of Jason and his story. And his friends largely blow him off, by the way, before they, in turn, get the fuck blown up by Jason later on in the film. Not literally, but we'll give Jason a pass on that one because the kills are great anyway. And we will get to that when we count the corpses. Uh, But, you know... That's the way it goes. So why don't you tell us about the writer's vision for Jason, Mike? Well, you know how I mentioned that Jason stops running as as, as of part six when he becomes zombie Jason? Up until that point, he would actually run after his prey, and his movements were much faster and more agile. Well, Shannon and Swift wanted to go back to that. And my guess is that that this is in no small part because they based the reboot on parts two through the final chapter. Uh, But they also chose to reinvent Jason's reason for killing a bit. Rather than just killing anyone who happens to come along, Jason lives off the land and people on his turf mean taking away resources. So Jason in this film is just protecting his territory like a wild animal would. This wild man, this hunter idea, was particularly inspired by John Rambo in First Blood from 1982 at least for Derek Mears, the guy playing Jason in the 2009 reboot is concerned. Uh, To Mears, the similarity is both Jason and Rambo being calculating and setting up people to fall into his traps. Uh, Jason has been wronged, though, by the murder of his mother, and that is, of course, a part of it as well. Jason does still have a sympathetic aspect to him. Mears also said he related to Jason the victim when he was growing up and he wanted to portray Jason as a victim in the film. To Mears, Jason represents people who were bullied in high school, specifically those with physical deformities for being outcasts. Did you want to say something? Nope. Just no. remarking on that David's amazing uh, part of that, making him like Rambo. That's pretty fucking frightening, but I'm sorry I interrupted. <laughs> Keep going. No problem, no problem. Uh, But as Brad Fuller uh, and Andrew Form learned on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning from 2006, you do not want to make the killer too sympathetic. So they decided against an origin story. They felt that focusing too much on his tormented childhood would lean too far into that and work to demystify the character in an unhelpful manner. Fuller said, we do not want him to be sympathetic. Jason is not a comedic character. He is not sympathetic. He's a killing machine, plain and simple. Those were some conflicting ideas, but it seems to have worked, if you ask me. How about you, Nim? Yeah, I mean, you know, listening to you talk about all that, I definitely get it. Um, and I will say that Jason was most definitely not sympathetic in this movie. He, to be honest with you, he kind of came off like the killer offspring of Deliverance and Rambo at times. And quite <laughs> frankly, that is fucking terrifying. So um, mission accomplished to them. Oh, wow. Squeal for me, boy. Squeal for me. And as he kills you, <laughs> god damn. All right. Let's get into a little bit of casting. Um, so two of the stars of the TV hit Supernatural starred in remakes of 80 slasher films in 2009. Jensen Ackles starred in My Bloody Valentine, while Jared Padalecki starred as Clay Miller in Friday the 13th. Now, it's worth noting that Padalecki also starred in 2005's remake of House of Wax prior to joining the cast of Supernatural. Clay Miller was obviously supposed to be a parallel to the ill-fated Rob Dyer from Friday the 13th, Part 4, though he had a much better fate in this film. And I know that Macabre Mike absolutely loves the way Rob Dyer died in that movie. <laughs> uh, I, I thought 
Padalecki was really quite solid as Clay Miller, even if the film took a slight departure from the traditional final girl formula of past films. Um, what did you think of Padalecki as Clay, Mike? I think I like Clay Miller actually more than Rob, he's killing me, Dyer. Uh, <laughs> but to be fair, I already like Padalecki quite a bit from Supernatural. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a little biased there. Uh, but as far as the departure from the final girl trope, I like this subversion of expectation. I mean, knowing what happened to Rob Dyer, I was not expecting Miller to last long, if you know what I mean. Also, did you notice that Danielle Panabaker, uh, played, who played Jenna in the film, was, was in there? And she also played Killer Frost in the Arrowverse. That's where I know her from, anyway. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I know. First of all, I have to say, I know exactly what you mean when it comes to Clay. I was expecting that dude to buy it early, given the obvious connections to Rob Dyer. I thought that that fucker had a target on his back and he was going to be like hanging me at any moment. And throughout the whole movie, I expected him to go and he just keeps getting on. So they definitely subverted my expectations there. As for Daniel Panabaker, I have loved her acting for a while, going all the way back to uh, Sky High. And uh, she was also in a legal drama called Shark that I loved her in. So no surprise here. I loved her in this movie as well. And when her character died, I'll be honest with you, I was seriously bummed. So I think that speaks to how much I love the actress. And I also love the character. So I, I actually have my issues with her character that I will get into later. Uh, but <laughs> I was definitely bummed when she died. Uh, but while we're on the subject of casting... Um, I have to talk about Derek Mirzabeard, and he's the guy who got to play Jason Voorhees. Uh, nine others had played Jason up until 2009 when this film was made. Um, Ari Lehman uh, played Jason as a child, jumping out and grabbing Alice out of the boat. Um, and uh, Steve Dash, uh, one, of your, one of your favorites, you liked him. Mm -hmm. And Warrington Gillette in part two. Uh, Richard Bro Brooker uh, in part three. Ted White, another one of your favorites in the final chapter. Tom Morga in part five, which we won't talk about because that movie sucks <laughs> balls. C.J. Graham in part six. And the man, Kane Hodder, the, the only actor to have played Jason more than once, in part seven. Eight and Jason Goes to Hell and Jason X. And Ken... Kierzinger in Freddy vs. Jason. Uh, that is quite a legacy of shoes to fill, and in my opinion, Derek Mears did a good, great job. Uh, but he almost didn't get the part. The problem is that Mears is actually a very nice person with a pleasant demeanor. I mean, like, overly nice. Like, you wouldn't think there was even a mean bone in this guy. So nice and pleasant, in fact, that the, the studio questioned whether or not Mears could even pull off pulling a brutal killing machine like Jason Voorhees. But Mears, who is actually a cage fighter with daddy issues, his words, by the way, assured them that he could turn it on when he needed to, and Mears did come at the recommendation of special effects makeup uh, supervisor Scott Stoddard uh, and other industry professionals, although Mears was unaware of this. Mears Mears had simply heard about the film months back and started physical training for the role and auditioned. <laughs> wow. Talk about catharsis. I mean, so, uh, Mears, how did you get over your daddy issues? Uh, well, uh, I let my inner Jason out on 2009's Friday the 13th. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, you know, it makes me wonder what work character I need to play to exercise my issues. Uh, chime in, everyone out there, and hit us up at, at MSSFTC2 on all my socials and let me know what horror character do you think I need to let my inner demons out. So, <laughs> oh nice. man, God Almighty. All right, enough of that. Enough of that fantasy work. You know, we could do therapy stuff later. So, uh, I will say, though, that one very interesting note that also happens to be very strange about this film. Michael Bay, yes, that Michael Bay, was involved with this film as co-owner of Platinum Dunes. Now, one of the characters in the film, Trent, is played by Travis Van Winkle. Trent is an arrogant, anal, muscle-bound asshole in the film, and he ultimately buys it. More on that when we count the corpses. But it just so happens that Travis Van Winkle also played a character with the same characteristics named Trent DeMarco, in 2007's Transformers, directed by, wait for it, Michael Bay. But wait a minute. There's more. There's a strange twist here. Because, okay. according to Michael Bay, the Trent 
and Friday the 13th and the Trent and Transformer are the same character, meaning that Transformers and Friday the 13th are in the same universe. What? Now, that <laughs> is some crazy shit. I mean, what do you think, Mike? Do you think do you think, do you think Feral Jason is going to go after Bumblebee if he hides out at Camp Crystal Lake? Do you want to see that movie, by the way? And if Shia LaBeouf's character ends up at the lake, who are you rooting for? And would Megan Fox have made a good final girl? I am flabbergasted. Like you said, mind blown. I mean, is it wrong that I want to see Optimus Prime fastball special Jason at Megatron? That would be fucking dope, man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, that is a lot to answer all at once, but um, I will best. I will do my best to do so before we get into production. Uh, the Jason from this 2009 reboot would absolutely go after Bumblebee if Bumblebee came into his territory. On the flip side of that, if Optimus tried to fastball a special Jason, he might just pull back a four-fingered hand for his efforts. <laughs> as far as Megan Fox goes, I am not sure how she would do as a final girl. I've only seen Fox in one horror movie, Jennifer's Body, and I was impressed with her performance there. Uh, so she could potentially pull it off, but... I mean, it's hard to tell that she was the bad guy in Jennifer's body. She was the evil, you know, demon-possessed woman in that movie. So, that I mean, that's not Final Girl material. <laughs> so, then, and then that's really my only other basis of comparison, really, is, is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I, I don't remember the Transformers movie enough to say whether or not I would root for Sam Witwicky, uh, but I can say that I do not have the issues with LeBeau that uh, many others do. How is that? It's 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 all good, man. It all works. And personally, I think Megan Fox is more likely to go bad girl as well. And she would probably be the Friday the Thirteenth version of Harley Quinn, whatever the hell that looks like. So, <laughs> God, that is fucking terrifying right there. And I'm I'm down for it. I want to see that shit. Um, actually, actually, there is a there is a um, you know how they have parody accounts and stuff on Twitter. Uh -huh. Yep. There is somebody that that uh, portrays themselves as Jason's daughter, so the concept for that for that is really already kind of out there. You know, wow. maybe Megan Fox could do something like that. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, let's see. Yeah, she'd be like luring people in. That Jason comes out of the bag. He's like, "Why are you messing with my daughter?" What? You know. So. <laughs> what? I got one rule. You know, you can sleep on my farm, but I got one rule: don't mess with my daughter. And then Megan Fox comes out, and you're fucked. So, uh, anyway. we all know how that we all, we all know how that rule ends. <laughs> yeah, uh, I will say, as for Sam Witwicky, I think dude bites it in the first act as he chases that stupid little dog from Transformer, and Jason plants his machete through his spine. But that's just my two cents, anyway. So, I dig it. All right, let's get on into production and principal photography. So, speaking of Jason. Scott Stoddard said his visual effects design was a combination of Carl Fulgen's design from Friday the 13th Part 2, a movie that both you and I like, and Tom Savini's design on the final chapter, yet another movie that you and I both like. Um, I could definitely see, although I have to say I like Part 2 more than you did, I think, but Part 4 we were definitely right simpatico on. I could definitely see that in design, and as we go from the potato sack chic look from Part 2 to the classic hockey mask that Savini used in the final chapter. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. So excellent designers. Excellent. Good job with the Jason sheet. So thank you, Tim Gunn. I don't know that you will make another appearance today, but thank you for showing up. Uh, so, <laughs> oh man, it's early or Just late. Just the fact here, that Tim Gunn showed up on a horror podcast is horror in and of itself, man. <laughs> well, what you don't know is that Tim Gunn has actually wanted to play Jason once upon a time, but he just hasn't grown into the role yet. And so he's always willing to come in and opine about Jason because secretly Tim Gunn wants to play Jason himself, but he would settle for Freddy Krueger. And there is something absolutely terrifying is that that voice coming out of a Freddy Krueger mask. Think about that. So, <laughs> uh, No. No, I'm not thinking about that. <laughs> uh, back to production, though. So Stoddard's vision for Jason was grotesque, you know, as if Jason was a looker before. And it included hair loss, skin rashes, and the traditional form deformities in the face. In other words, 
Jason was just an escapee from the Hills Have Eyes, but I digress. Uh, Star <laughs> wanted to present a more human side to Jason, one that would allow us to envision him as a uh, human shaped by circumstances and isolation. Mears was required to wear full body makeup from the chest upwards while performing as Jason. He also wore a chest plate with thick skin that would adjust to his muscle movements along with a hump on his back. Uh, for me, the most impressive part of all of this is that this costume design really didn't inhibit the movement of the performer. A huge task for all special effects and creature designers. And we know how much I'm into movement, especially when it comes to this version of Jason. Um, I thought that Mears moved with ferocity and speed, and he looked believable and suitably dangerous every time he was on screen. And that fucking totally. just endeared me to this movie. I fucking loved it. Um, well, I also well, well, where where does where does Mears rank then? Uh, in the Jasons that I've seen so far, that you've seen so uh, far, if we between Ted White and. Uh, uh, what was that? The first guy's name, uh, Steve Dash. Steve Dash. Ooh, you know what? I love Steve Dash, but I love White even more. But I, I, I will say that for me, White is top, top of the tier, and I'm gonna put okay. Mears right after him, and then Steve Dash third. So uh, okay. I hate to do that to my boy Steve Dash, but I, I think that um, Mears was fantastic, and I think he really gives White a run for his money. So, what about totally. you? Totally, I'm, I'm, I'm with my, my, my favorite is always going to be Kane Hodder, and I think you'll see why when we get to those movies. But, but, but Mears, Mears was really good. I really liked him. Cool. Uh, I will also say, as far as the makeup goes, a prosthetic eye was glued to Mears so that he can emote with realistic eye movements. That doesn't sound fucking uncomfortable at all. Uh, all in all, <laughs> this just sounds incredibly tedious. And I will say that the NIM part of my brain revolts at it. On the other hand, the effect is on point, and Jason looks legit in this film. Too much so at times, which is a very strange thing to say. I, I as, This is going to sound weird, but I'm just going to put it out there. I expect my Jason and my Freddy Krueger to be a little bit monster, a little bit Hollywood, and a little bit of old Hollywood creature, going all the way back to, like, creature from the Brack Lagoon and the mummy and stuff like that. This Jason, on the other hand, was all testosterone and backwoods badass. I mean, it was great. Don't fucking get me wrong, but it was slightly off-putting to me, and I can't say why exactly. But enough of that, though. Why don't you take this section home, Mike, by talking about the Sultan of Slash's hockey mask, which I know you're a big fan of. I will I will do that. I will do that in just a minute. Um, But I... I, I... I'd like to I'd like to comment uh, on the makeup effects in, in the film for just a second. Uh, Stoddard initially spent three and a half hours applying the makeup to Mir's head and torso. He was eventually able to reduce the required time to just over an hour for scenes in which Mir's wore the hockey mask. <laughs> so it, it just it covered up a lot of what he had to work on, basically. Uh, for That's scenes it. in which Jason, what? That's it? Just an hour? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, o over an hour. He couldn't even oh. get it down to just an hour. For scenes in which Jason's face is revealed, it took approximately four hours to apply that makeup. Oh, shit. Uh, do you think you could go into work for several weeks of shooting and sit there and have all that done, Mike? I honestly don't think I could, and Lord help you if you get an itch during that whole fucking process. So, uh, I think we need a stab signal for all the folks who apply this makeup and the poor bastards who have to sit there and be worked on like a fucking 74 Pinto. So, <laughs> To paraphrase ACDC, for those about to have makeup done and for those about to put it on, we salute you. <laughs> I Damn don't think right. I could sit there for hours without something to do, like read a comic or watch a movie or something. Uh, but let's move on to the mask itself. Uh, just like with the makeup and with the writing, Jason's mask was inspired by parts three and four uh, when, when he wore the hockey mask. Scott started to use the original mold from the final chapter, as the one from part three no longer exists. From that mold, he made six different versions of the mask because he didn't want to take something that already existed. Every 
director. Every every person that comes on has got to put their new stamp on something. And that is yeah. why masks will always change from film to film and makeup will always change. Everybody wants to put their own particular stamp on it. And that was apparently the case here too as well. Uh, there were things that he really liked uh, about the about the old mask and some things that he wanted to change. Uh, basically, he wanted to customize it without losing the fundamentals of the design, especially the markings on the forehead and the cheeks, uh, but he aged them up a bit and broke them up. Now, I have already said that the final chapter mask is my favorite. Uh, it's the one I'm wearing now, uh, but this, this one was good. I have no complaints. How about you, Dark Lord? Yeah, um... Now, granted, I'm not as big a aficionado into, look at, there's that word again, into mass as you, Bar, but uh, I thought the mass was perfectly acceptable to iconic. <clears throat> uh, for me, it has the appropriate look, and I was glad when he donned it. Uh, I'm not as big a fan of the sack over the head, though, and here's why. It scares the shit out of me <laughs> in a way I can't quite put my finger on. It is much more disturbing to me than the hockey mask. Don't ask me why. But I'm just kooky that way. But that fucking sack over the head, ooh, gives me the creeps. Uh, just as a quick side note before I comment on that, um, yeah. I, I think I think that one of the things that I really liked about this reboot is that we actually got to see Jason get the mask in part three when he, when we get it oh we, we we don't even get to see the kill happen uh we just get to see the body left over we just see him go into the room where he's at and then he comes out wearing the mask and the guy's dead i i i really i i, I prefer how they did that in this particular bit here also when he puts the fucking mask on doesn't it feel like you should get like you should get an achievement like he leveled up or something in a video game? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, so cha ching the little thing goes yeah, up on the screen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you, you get a perk point, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> but 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 as to your your sackhead thing, um, perhaps your fear comes from two real life serial killers in the Phantom Killer, aka the Phantom Slayer, from 1946 in Texarkana, what the the town that dreaded sundown is based on, and the Zodiac Killer in the Bay Area in 1968 and 1969. Granted, with the Zodiac Killer, it was a bit more than just a sack on his head, but you get what I mean. By the way, by the way, a little quick. Notice well, one of the reasons I linked the two is it is theorized by some because the Phantom Killer was never found from 1946. They, don't, they have no idea who he was. Nobody discovered him. But, and the Zodiac Killer might be the same person. Both of them, like, it, and, and it might be an evolution thing that we we're talking about there. With the Phantom Killer, he wore just the sack on his head. But the, the theory goes that the, the reason the Zodiac thing had evolved into the whole almost kind of outfit thing that the Zodiac Killer had, uh, that, that that was just an evolution of, of the serial killer himself. And, and that perhaps maybe the, these are the same third person. But but do you think that adds to your fear of the sackhead, Jason? And, and what do you think about that theory? First of all, I had never heard that theory about the Phantom Killer and the Zodiac Killer. And that's it's pretty crazy. I, I've, I've read the book Zodiac. My brother is much more into Zodiac than I am. But I had never heard that. That's, that's pretty interesting. I might have to go and do some research on that afterwards. Um, I always find some of those theories really interesting. Like there's another one uh, that there was a killer who went on a spree across the United States in the early 1900s. And some theorized that was actually Jack the Ripper who came over um, from England. Oh, and then yeah, started I know who you're talking well. about. I, yeah. I, know, I know what guy you're talking about. That, that shit-eating fucker. Yeah, I don't remember yeah, the guy's from the name. from the White but, City, right? Yeah, but yep. But it, 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 it's plausible, just like that one's plausible. So that's really interesting that you bring that up. I'm going to have to check that out. Um, as for the sack, uh, the sack head, is that what we're calling it now? Sack head? That sounds like that, something People call happened. him sack head Jason. Okay. Uh, I will say that sack head, for me, sounds like something that when you wake up from a good sleep or something, you know, you wake up, you're like, oh, I've got sack head, but whatever. <laughs> uh, that works. <laughs> but uh, I don't know that those serial killers at the forefront of my brain when I think about Sackhead, even though that was really interesting. I think what it is for me is this that irregular shape over the head and then you have those cold, crazed eyes peering out of the sack. It just screams crazy and danger to me. I mean, like my this? dangers... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, my, my, my danger sense starts to tingle and I want to run away screaming like a little girl. 
I mean, I think that's just a natural reaction, though, right? Or am I just fucking being a little girl about the whole thing? So. <laughs> I'm going to say that a Dark Lord screaming like a little girl is not a natural reaction. Okay, okay. I, I'm just Fair trying enough. to protect Fair. your reputation as a Dark Lord there. I don't want, I don't want oh. the other demon lords laughing at you later, you know what I mean? Well, you see, I've got two personas, you know, it's like Shazam. In my normal form, I'm just Nim, and then I, like, say the appropriate words, which I'm not going to say here. And then I transform into Dark Lord. Yeah, so. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, yeah, I, I could see what you're saying. Uh, I, I guess, I guess I was just curious if your if your mind went there like mine did. Uh, but I, I tend to go to serial killers a lot. That's just kind of where my brain goes. But uh, Richie had a pretty cool death. Uh, you, you 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 remember you remember when Richie died, right? Oh yeah, yeah that, absolutely. That was. That was pretty sweet, and a nice blend of practical and CGI effects. Uh, director Marcus Nispel usually only allowed minimal use of CGI effects in his film, and this is one of those movies that I refer to on how to blend CGI and practical effects well. But Nem will get into more of that in a minute. For this kill, Mears was holding a handle of the machete, on, and, and, on, and on the handle was a half a blade, which made it look like it was buried into Richie's head. The CGI mm. crew filled in the rest of the machete blade so that it looked whole and even added the skin sagging on Rich's face a little bit to make it look like there was nerve damage or nerves severed. Uh, but what what did you think of the FX here, Dark Lord? Plus, I know you have some other scenes to talk about as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, I will say that uh, that CG work was very well done. And I think the technical work on it was also top notch. You know, we always love to talk about special effects and CGI here and how it holds up or doesn't hold up and blending and stuff. So I was really looking forward to this section for this movie in particular. Um, I will also say on Richie's Kill, one of the things that I've learned a lot about in the past couple of years was uh, lighting and how hard it is to do that and to have it match the actual lighting for the CG and what was done on set. And the ambient lighting on this CG face is incredibly well done, uh, especially for the time in 2009. And I think the effect really came off. They must have taken a lot of light samples and they managed to light it well, uh, probably mostly because it was at night. So it's kind of easier to do that with the lighting the way it worked. But still, it looked really good. Um, yeah. Let's also. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's do a little post production as well. And I'm going to get some more into the movie itself and the visual effects in a little more detail. So. Visual Effects House Asylum created CGI weapons, like you were noting about with uh, the kill for Richie, for various death scenes in the movie. In one scene in which Nolan is killed suddenly by an arrow to the head, yeah, that was fucking intense, um, Asylum created the CG arrow in post-production. In yet another scene, Jason hurls a hatchet at Lawrence as he runs away, striking him in the back. The shot of a hatchet flying through the air in one instance, appearing in the same frame as the actor would be too difficult to achieve practically. I mean, it would be nearly in fucking impossible. Uh, so Asylum rendered a complete 3D model of the hatchet, then inserted the model into the frames leading up to the frame in which it hits the character in the back. One of the final images added by Asylum was for Trent's death seed. Here, Asylum digitally created a metal spike that burst through Chint's chest as Jason slams him onto the back of a tow truck. So let's break this down for a moment. I think Mike and I have talked quite a bit about the proper use of CG and practical effects and how the two complement each other. Um, in fact, Mike brought it up before. It's one of our favorite subjects. And I do have to say that Asylum had some very nice blending of practical and CG effects in this movie, particularly in that hatchet scene and in the arrow scene. Filming those weapons actually flying through the air as they head towards the victim would require some iffy camera work and a lot of fucking edits and cuts. Um, mm -hmm. It would also have required slow camera work with fake weapons that would then be sped up to create the illusion of danger. And the thing is, is when you do that, the brain always sees that and tells you that something's wrong, even though it looks okay on the film. Um, but in this case, we have some great CG work, and that is enhanced by practical work when the weapon actually strikes the victim. It's great stuff. 
I could not agree more, my friend. I, I think we can both point to the 2009 Friday the 13th reboot as an example of how to blend those two those two effects properly, and an example of how it can how good it can really look when it's done right. I think it is the superior way to do special effects, and I'm pretty sure that you agree with that, Dark Lord. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the things, like I said, that we've hit on continuously, and I hope we never let up. Horror movies are visual and visceral, and CGI can help you get that visual, but I have to say, nothing beats practical effects for pure visceral shock value. Be guts and blood spurting out and real, you know, in real time, real practical effects gives you the visceral nature of the kill as well. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Awesome. Now, all that said, I'm not as big a fan of the work when Trent is killed. This is a fairly straightforward shot, and I wish they had stuck to practical effects here with some great gore and human juice to go with it. I thought you would like human that juice. human juice. <laughs> uh, there are a number of ways they could have accomplished this kill practically, and it would have given us that ventral sense of murder that makes girls swoon and boys yearn for spring nights. So uh, what do you think of all that, Mike? How did the final effect strike you? And what did you think of the Trent kill as well? Um, I have to agree that, that this is a shot where they didn't deliver quite as well. For one, you can barely make out what has run through Trent. It looks more like a chainsaw, like without a chain on it, with how it is shaped. Uh, but when it comes to putting him on the back of the tow truck, uh, they could have, at the very least, used practical effects once he was on the truck. This, this kill could have been much more cooler than it was, in my opinion. Absolutely. As always, you are right on point, my friend, when it comes to gore and gruesomeness most oh macabre one so <laughs> why don't you take yourself an evil piece and a stab signal for being right on point as always damn whoa evil piece oh my god oh my god oh oh and a stab signal too oh man that was good stuff thank you sir you are most welcome sir you deserve it you are always bringing everything to this show, and I, I know you love yourselves. A little evil piece with some stab signal to go with it. So enjoy hell it, my yeah, friend. Hell yeah. A little stab signal sauce, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, as for uh, prose production here, the final bit I have to bring up is the use of music in the movie. Um, now, one of the things that appealed to me about the original Friday the 13th films was its minimal use of music. In fact, you introduced me to this, Mike, and once I picked up on it, I really dug it because the only time you hear background music it was is when Jason is on screen, and it's only his, you know, theme, that one, yeah. uh, which is iconic. In this case, the director brought in various pieces of uh, contemporary music during the film, and if I'm being honest, it took me out of the Friday the 13th vibe. It's a little thing. It is a little thing. But after cramming a bunch of these movies into my schedule lately, it really stood out. At times, the introduction of these characters uh, along with the music had me confused. And I sometimes wondered if I was watching Friday the 13th or Final Destination. So, you know, it is what it is, though. And the movie was still great for it, but it is a departure from the original films. So enough about old man and his hangups. I'm old. I'm a dark lord. I'm going to be passed up by Macabre Mike, and he's going to put me down into the pit for all time. But until that happens, <laughs> why don't you get us started on the movie itself, Mike? Um, sure thing, Jim. Uh, but I, I just, I just want to comment that I think, I think that perhaps I, I don't, I don't know that the only thing I can think of for the reason that they didn't use the music like like it was used in the previous films uh, was maybe they didn't. They didn't understand the the purpose or the nuance of it or or something like that. I mean, because I mean, that's a whole part of the 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 shot from the first person perspective. You know, we're supposed to know what what that means. That it's not just your average person doing this. That we we know it's the killer when this happens. It's it's part of the whole setup of the film there. So I mean, I, I could see how that I could see how that it would take you out uh, of yeah. it because it's it's it. It just doesn't have that that same that same feel with the music. It's like they went all Friday the Thirteenth Part Three on it or something. Yeah, I I think the other part of it is that um, this movie, that specifically that part, 
um, I think it's just because this was post Scream. You know, once Scream came along and introduced, um, you know, pop music or 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 metal and stuff into it, and it became popular like that, and then you you had Final Destination, and I know what you did last summer, and blah blah, you know, on and on and on. This became right. the new formula, and so in trying to modernize the film, I think that's what they did. I kind of wish they hadn't, but there it is. That's probably a good call. I think you're right about that. So we have to talk about how this 2009 reboot has elements of part two, three, and the final chapter in it. Miss Voorhees being killed at the beginning in the flashback was a lot like how they flashback to part one at the beginning of part two. Also, like part two, the legend of Jason is told as a creepy campfire story at the beginning. And Mike and Whitney discovering an abandoned cabin with a shrine that had Mrs. Voorhees' head and Whitney impersonating Mrs. Voorhees are elements from part two as well. Uh, but that's not all. Of course, of course, when Whitney was doing it, she was holding up the, the locket thing, but same, same, same kind of idea there. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, Mark's wheelchair... Uh, he, one of your favorite kills. <laughs> and Mrs. Voorhees' sweater can be seen in Jason's tunnel during the film. You can also see Crazy Rob's bicycle propped up against the wall just uh, behind the wheelchair. Uh, a group of friends showing up at the cabin to party is like how kids went to the cabin across from the Jarvis house and meeting Clay, who is looking for his missing sister, who was killed by Jason, like the group running into Mike Dyer, looking for his sister, Sandra, who was killed in part two in the and in, in the final chapter. Uh, uh, there were nods to certain kills and stuff, too, as well, throughout the film. And honestly, blending all these things into the film is one of the big reasons that I'd really like it. It homages without repeating, and that is brilliant and fun, in my opinion. Absolutely. I mean, this movie really did feel like an homage to the Friday the 13th movies that came before it. Um, with some notable exceptions that I will not mention for mere fear of making uh, Mike's head go scanners on all of you. So I will leave those movies out. <laughs> part five and uh, Jason takes Manhattan. So um, <laughs> personally, uh, I think that this approach had both it's good and bad points um, on the plus side. It was cool to see a lot of the elements of earlier films, as you pointed out. And it was really cool to see the reimagine in this reboot of the series and what they brought to life uh, was compelling and interesting. On the other hand, they had a lot to cover a lot. And some of the elements seemed a little rushed, and I don't know that it was possible to give them all of the time they deserve. Um, so what am I talking about? One very notable example for me was Whitney. Um, we're first introduced to her character in the opening prologue, and she did disappears off screen as her brother Clay enters the picture for the majority of the film. Uh, we have no idea what happened to her, and we end come to find out that Jason kept Whitney alive because she resembled his mother. However, by the time she returns to the screen, all we really have time for is for her to scream for help and for her to be rescued by Clay and Jenna. Then, just Jenna, pangs of love coming out of her chest because she is so in love with Clay, also has her chest ripped out of her by a jealous Jason. It's too bad. Uh, however, I did oh, like... this complex here. <laughs> yeah. Like, God damn. Um, but I love to say it. I like the Clay Whitney dynamic as I enjoyed the Rob and Sandra Dyer dynamic in the final chapter. I just wish we could have gotten more of it, but there's, there's no room in the film. The film is tightly packed and on pace. And I think if you added any of that stuff in, it would have slowed the film down too much. So, Well, I agree that it was sad and I too liked the Clay and Jenna together. Even, even if I think Jenna should have just broken up with Trent instead of just running off with Clay. I don't honestly blame Trent for sleeping with Bree, <laughs> but that is a whole other discussion. <laughs> I, I liked that Jason killing Jenna up to the stakes. At that point in the film, we were sure that Jenna, Whitney, and Clay were going to make it out. And when Jason killed Jenna, it felt like all the bets were off. We might be lucky to have one of these final three survive is what that told me. Uh, yeah, I will say that that was a real kick in the gut. And one I did not see coming. I was convinced that Jenna was going to be the final girl, to be personally honest with you. So uh, I was shocked. Um, now, I thought that Clay was going to buy it at any moment, as I said before. And I thought maybe, maybe instead of one final girl, we'd have two final girls and Jenna and Whitney escaping. That was my other thought. But nope. 
Uh, the writers flipped it all over and killed off the prototypical final girl, Ajita, in order to keep the brother sister team alive. And it was a huge twist and an effective one. Now, another thing I have to note is the limited amount of sex and nudity in the film. According to the producers, <laughs> what was that? What are you laughing at? A limited amount of sex and nudity in the film? <laughs> Really? <laughs> Are you just expecting everyone to run around naked? <laughs> yes. What's wrong with that? Oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> you know, Chase is coming to kill me. Hold on, let me strip off everything and wave my schlong around real quick. There you go. All right, now you can kill me. So, God you just had to feel like Bjorn before you died. Yeah, that is something <laughs> I never thought I would say. Come get me, serial killer. Let me wave my slong around for a bit before you get me. I got to get my moment of glory. So, God damn. I think I belong in the Mojave Desert. All right. <laughs> According to the producers, test, test audiences felt there was too much sex and nudity. What, what is that line anyway? You know, where does it become too much? You're just sitting there watching, and like, ah, oh, yes. Uh, oh, shit. I've seen one breast too many. Take it back, dial it back. I I, I, I gotta say I gotta say for me there there is there is a line and that is when like for instance um um uh uh uh, uh a Game of Thrones crossed that line in the first couple of seasons. There was nudity just for the fuck of nudity. We're like people are sitting here having this serious conversation and just for the fuck of it, we'll have some naked people having sex in the background just to have it on there. That yep. that that kind of that there's no there's no point in that and it it took away from the the weight of the scene usually. Yep, and I hated every second of it. It was horrible, so <laughs> terrible. Bad Game of Thrones, bad. <laughs> As I look over it on my Game of Thrones CDs over there, so uh, and we 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 are actively wondering when it's too much. I mean, is there a meter? Is there a boob meter that fills up? Is there a schlong meter that fills up? I would say my schlong meter is probably less than the boob meter. All right, I digress. I'm going off on a tangent. Uh, the filmmakers <laughs> decided to cut back for the theatrical version. Boo, boo. Oh, I mean, yay, yay. Uh, so, um, <laughs> I'm fucking, I am, a, I am a dirty old man. There it is. All right, seriously, though, I think this really illustrated the generational shift in the horror audience. I mean, in the 70s and 80s, we wanted terror and tits, if we're being honest. And then we got both of those in abundance. And anything else we got beyond that in our horror movies was just a fucking bonus, you know? So um, starting in the 90s and continuing on in today's horror, uh, it's become more sophisticated. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's the one I'm going to use. So there. Uh, it feels like horror. Yep. I think I think a lot of it actually came from a, a, a shift that happened, uh, particularly in the in the latter '80s and into the '90s. Particularly is when it really started, uh, but when the the women's movement really started coming in, uh, the, it started to become uh, um, uh, not like it was it was not a good thing to just randomly show women as sex objects anymore. This this became uh, a faux pas to do. Absolutely. Plus, I think. That when you were doing those movies like they did in the past, um, you were limiting your audience. I mean, most women weren't considered horror fans at that point, you know, and women are very much a huge part of the horror fandom now. And I think the reason was is that you were only appealing to, you know, men who were going to go to the horror movies and those lesbians who were into terror and seeing naked women. So, you know, um, there is an audience there, but it's not as big as the audience that you get now. So I Good agree point. with you on that point as well. Um, but uh, I will say it feels like horror doesn't have to throw in a nice body anymore to attract an audience as people appreciate the genre for what it has to offer instead of cheap titillation. See what I did there? So <laughs> um, anyway, let's have a stab signal and memoriam for cheap titillation as we celebrate the new age of war, so. <laughs> oh, man. 
So, uh, yeah, don't at me, folks, and send your email to mapobmike at gmail.com. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, before we move on, a quick evil piece question for all of you out there and for Macabre Mike, and it's an easy one, I will admit. What 80s screen queen never showed her assets until she starred in the 1983 comedy Trading Places? And yes, I do know that Randy already answered this at Scream, hence why it's easy. Over to you. To quote the movie, when do I get to see Jamie Lee Curtis breasts? She never showed her tits until she went legit. And I will take that evil piece and gobble that shit down. No, no. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Scream. Nice, nice. Nice one, bro. Uh, I knew that you would get that, you horny little devil you. So uh, take <laughs> us home so we could get to La Quinta, senor. Hell yes, hell yes. Just just a bit more, and we'll be diving into our favorite part of the show, Counting the Horpses. In all of the other films, it seems like Jason just kind of appears out of nowhere to kill his victims. Like, all of a sudden, he comes upon them and kills them. But in this reboot, we, we see that Jason actually set it up so that Jason has dug out a system of tunnels so that he they go all over the area, and he uses them to get around. In fact, the whole area is set up with trip wires and that rings bells down below so he knows when someone or something is up there. I like this a lot and I think it adds to the territorial hunter aspect of Jason that they were going for here. A hunter survivalist Jason would absolutely set up his territory like that in my opinion. How about you, Nim? Uh, tell us what you thought about the tunnels and then we'll dive into counting the corpses. Yeah, I mean, as I said before, um, this Jason in this movie is some sort of backwoods badass, an alpha male who has marked his territory. He's also a bit of a genius, to be fucking honest, and an engineering savant. I mean, there's a lot going on here, and Jason is sort of this renaissance man out there in the fucking woods who could do almost anything. I mean, where do you get this goddamn knowledge? Who knows? And honestly, do we really fucking care? I don't. So, uh, more power to you, Jason. May you never find me and macabre Mike, and keep killing all those kids out in Crystal Lake. So, <laughs> and it is now time to contar los cadavres. That special time when Madman get giddy and what once was gruesome becomes positively gory. That's right. <laughs> we are going to count the corpses. Are you ready, sir? Yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> all right. Corpse number one. Is an old favorite. Good old Pamela Voorhees makes a cameo appearance and loses her head once again as the character, formerly known as Alice Hardy, gives the machete chop the old college shy. Jason decides <laughs> to take Mama's cabeza and head for the hills. See what I did there? That won't come back to haunt anybody. But unlike Alice, though, this co-ed chopper gets a little head and then fucks right off, never to be seen again. Jason does not pass go, and he does not collect $200. Better luck next time, big boy. <laughs> <laughs> that always reminds me of that Crypt Keeper when he, when he cut, off the, <laughs> cut off that girl's head. It flies off yeah. in the air and lands in front of him. I love it when a woman gives you a head and lets you keep it. <laughs> See, that's, that's, that was the titillation I was talking about, folks, but enough about that. We already gave our, our honorarium to it, so. <laughs> I, I think that Jason did not go after Alice because Jason's motivations in the reboot are different. In Friday the 13th Part 2, Jason is motivated by revenge to kill, kill Alice because she chopped off his mom's head. So he tracks her down and sticks an ice pick in her temple. But in this reboot, Jason is only concerned with living off the land and protecting his territory. What do you think of that? You know, I can see that. I can see that. And, uh, you know, Jason stalked out his territory and Alice got some waltz off into the sunset after chopping off her head. So, you know, everybody's happy there. So, good for them. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, corpse number two was Wade. He is all excited to have found what might be three or four wild-grown marijuana plants, which the creators <laughs> have obviously never seen. Uh, those were clearly grown with hydroponics, the one they had on the thing there, but whatever. Um, either way, uh, Wade hold and on, Richie... Hold on, hold on. You can't just say that and just gloss over it. You have so much knowledge about what's grown in hydroponics. Mike, Mike, are you giving us a little 
insight into you? I mean, we need to know more. <laughs> hey, I, 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 let's just say I've been around the block a time or two, okay? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You, you've done extensive studying and reading online. Okay, good. We're good. Yeah, that's what it is. Studying and reading online. Yes, yes. Good, good. All um, right. Either way, Wade, Wade and Richie are under the impression that about 2,500, maybe 3K worth of Mota at most means living easy like the rich folk. And they're also under the impression that rich folk just relax. Rich folk don't relax. That's why they're rich. And, and that's if they don't smoke any of that. And if they do all the work themselves. Sure, they could make some cash, but please. I'm not going to say they deserve to die, but both he and Rich are dumbasses in a game they don't know shit about. <laughs> Either way, it seems that Jason doesn't like folks messing with his weed. And so like John did to the Roman soldier in the garden, off went Wade's ear. It also looks like maybe Wade's throat was slashed in the process. I mean, Jason came down with some serious force showing you that you don't have to live by the sword to die by one we don't actually get to see the kill but that is my inference what do you think about that dark lord and did you appreciate the biblical reference there <laughs> i i absolutely <laughs> did although i find it interesting that uh we went biblical with this with the weed and and dumb asses and everything else but hey <laughs> you sir are a genius in and of yourself able to bring these disparate things together so Kudos to you, sir. In fact, why don't you take a stab signal for bringing the Bible and weed together like that? So, thank you. <laughs>
holy fuck. I've never seen that before, and wow. So what do you think about that? Oh, I think it's pretty cool that you responded like that. It reminds me of that in, uh, what was it? I think it was Halloween 5 when he, he uh, Michael Myers twisted that guy's head around, the bone was sticking out, and I all freaked yeah. out. And I was like, the bone's sticking out, the bone's sticking out. Like, I'm, I'm nice to... I like that you actually freak out about that stuff too. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> that that was pretty badass. And a step up from putting her in a sleeping bag and just smashing her up against a tree to kill her. Uh, not bad. Uh, not bad at all for corpse number three. My guess is that, though, my guess is that she died of suffocation. And her lungs were probably burned a bit from the heat. I say this because she looks scorched rather than extra crispy when she comes out of the bag. But that's my two cents. What happened to Wade's partner in crime, Richie? Ah, so let's go back to the cookout there. So, uh, <laughs> Richie hears Amanda heating up there and runs back to see what's up. The after Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> the cookout, that's... The, this is what you... We're officially going to call that now the Jason Voorhees barbecue. Yes. <laughs> So, Richie, after not finding the source of the noise out there, comes back to the barbecue and uh, to see what's going on. Jason, who's a wily old devil in this movie, has set up a bear trap in his path, and Richie stumbles into it and breaks his leg. And I have to say that the effects on the bear trap on the leg were pretty goddamn gruesome. I've never seen that in person, but if I had to imagine it in person, it would look like that. Um as he's watching Amanda being served well done, he struggles to free his leg from the bear trap. Then, Whitney runs into frame after noping right out following Jason's repeated fails to circumcise Mike. Whitney tries in vain to free Richie, and Richie loses his big boy words as Jason closes in for the kill. Now, at this point, you think that he's going to cross off Whitney, but instead, Jason buries his feelings and his machete right into Richie's fucking head with the effects that we had talked about before, which are fantastic. Yeah. At that point, Finito into prologue and Whitney disappears until the third act. Dum, dum, dum. What will happen? So <laughs> Rich getting that machete buried deep in his head is my favorite kill in the movie. That was just done so well. And it went so deep. What, what that sounds dirtier than I intended. Uh, I just meant that it was brutal. <laughs> so what's up with corpse number five, Nim? <laughs> Are you going for titillation again there, Mike? I was uh, going yeah. for titillation there. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Next up is an off-camera kill that I didn't have the heart to hand over to Mike. Now, the most bloodthirsty of all killers, Cancer, claims the life of Whitney and Clay's mother, Mrs. Miller. Although it's an off-camera kill, it is a kill that is mentioned in the movie and happens during the movie's timeline. So we are going to include it here. So back to you, Macabre One. Having had a couple family members die of cancer, that one did touch home for me. You know how I said earlier that Jason don't like people messing with his weed, though? I mean, you saw what happened to Wade and Richie. Well, corpse number five, a.k.a. Donnie, is no exception. It would seem that Donnie cleared out what Jason had been growing over there and was both smoking it and trying to sell it. Always a bad idea. But I think maybe Donnie's mannequin girlfriend got jealous of him making out with the girls in the magazine. So now to get now to get out of the doghouse, Donnie was saving up uh, to buy his mannequin girlfriend a dress or something. I don't know. Uh, that was one weird son of a bitch either way. Any thoughts on that paper woman liquor, Nim? You know, I think you're really on to something with the weed. I mean, you don't see Jason killing any of the other locals, like that creepy old lady at the beginning. Uh, you know, he leaves her alone. But Donnie, he's out there doing his shit, and he fucking pays for it. Um, I mean, he just slaughtered weed-stealing Donnie, thankfully saving us from having to watch the mannequin take another pounding. Yes, we are not <laughs> going into more details about that, folks. We're just going to leave that alone. Um, honestly, though... Consider this. He said she was tight. <laughs> They yeah. don't have any holes. I, just I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to hear about it. I don't need that kind of titillation. So, uh, but to be honest with you all, all of you out there, I'm a little worried that the hockey mask was right there near the mannequin. Was that fucker wearing that mask when? You know what? I don't want to go there either. Let's just fucking move on, man. Just keep going. So. Oh, 
my gosh. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Clear the cash. Clear the cash. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Nolan is course number six, and he he was just minding his own business, driving a topless water skier around Crystal Lake. Next thing you know, he has an arrow shot right through the back of his head, and he dies and falls into the steering wheel, spinning the boat around towards corpse number seven. Honestly, I didn't like Nolan and his complete lack of respect for other people's property and his whole I'm going to do it just because he said I can't bullshit. What a fucking child. Anyway, uh, what's up with numero siete? I, you know, first of all, before I get to numero siete, kudos to you for the Spanish there. I have to say, I didn't like Nolan either. He was kind of a dick, but God damn, Jason is, is harsh, man. Jason is not an easy person to cross. You get on Jason's bad side, and he's going to let you fucking know it. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, And you only know it for about a second. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, corpse number seven. So, after Nolan takes the arrow to the eye, Chelsea waits for Nolan to circle around for her, and she proceeds to take a friggin' motorboat to the dome. And this doesn't kill her, folks. <laughs> not by blood force trauma, not by drowning, not by blood loss. No, she's toughing it out like a virgin on an 0 for 29 streak at Mardi Gras. <laughs> so <laughs> then... As Chelsea is swimming into shore after friggin' tanking the motorboat, she happens to notice that Jason is waiting there to give her a little something something. So Chelsea becomes a swimmer now and bolts for the pier. Now Jason builds up our anticipation, stalking around like a squirrel looking for a nut before thrusting his machete down, slink <laughs> right down into Chelsea's dome through the slats in the pier. Then like the kind soul that he is, he raises up the body for just a moment. So we applaud Chelsea's rack. Let's give her a rack of sound of applause. And then she slides down to her final rest at Crystal Lake. Now let's entertain it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, actually, th this is this is one of the things I was talking about that that. Well, well, the shot was obviously gratuitous nudity because they had to have her topless. Uh, but there was a bit more to that scene than just an opportunity to show somebody naked. In that particular scene, Jason had thrust the machete down so far into her skull and body that she had to hit up against the pier to break free from the blade. Actually, I, I thought that was kind of cool in that regard. True, true. But I will say this. Call me crass. Call me juvenile. Call me what you will, but the Dark Lord likes a little bit of gratuitous nudity every now and then. <laughs> so, you know, I don't I, I mind. I couldn't tell. I, I had no idea. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, I also don't mind a bit of uh, non-gratuitous nudity, if I'm being honest, but I'm not sure what the hell that is. Um, but I did think that kill was pretty hardcore myself, and I especially liked how she thought she was safe and then wham! I'm not too sure that the blade wouldn't slide out when you tried to lift her, but if anyone was able to jam that sucker in there like that and get it stuck down so they had to wedge her off with the pier, it would be Jason. So I got to give him the, the points for that. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I think I think we're I think we're pretty close on that one. Yep. Uh, Chewy is corpse number eight, and he is the type of guy that is a whole lot of fun at the party for the first, I don't know, half hour or so, until he gets <laughs> wasted. And then he is annoying as fuck and falling over and breaking things. What a schmuck. Chewy gets roughed up a little bit before taking a screwdriver to the throat. I'll bet he is regretting ordering that drink. <laughs> Seriously, though. Uh, when... When Aaron Yu, uh, the actor who played Chewie, was performing his death, he was genuinely choking on blood in his mouth. Uh, but, wow. but, but, but yeah, he just went with it as just to get a better take. That coughing and choking, we've, <coughs> that's real. He's literally doing that. Mears asked him if he was okay when the take was over. He's like, Jesus Christ, man, are you all right? You know, because it, it, it took him a, a minute to recover. He said that he was fine, but, you know, he had to go for it for the, for the you know, just to get that good take. And Mir told you, uh, you are way too dedicated, kid. <laughs> well, God damn it, man. This, it's not like this is Shakespeare or something. Shit. Get a drink of water. We'll reset. Holy crap. Um, <laughs> but no, that kill was good. And, you know, credit to, to Mr. You there for what he did. So good job to you, sir. 
we enjoy watching you die. That's something that you can take with you to the rest of your career. So that is a weird thing, too. You know, I was the guy who died and choked on blood, you know, here at this point of the film. I said, well, that's very nice, you know. So uh, let's see. I, I don't know. There, there are some actors that are willing to go all the way like that, like Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Like I, I know from I, I know for a fact he told Cher in Moonstruck to go ahead and slap him. And I'll tell you right now, don't tell Cher to slap you. She will do it. <laughs> <laughs> if you've seen that movie, you know she smacked the shit out of him. And he told. And I, I think I think there is something to actors like that that are that are willing to 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 give a little to to make the scene better. I, I don't know what the actual time is, but I think she might have slapped him so hard that she slapped him onto the set of Waterworld, but that's a whole other show. So. Uh, course number nine is Lawrence. Now, Lawrence is one of these guys, you know, i, I got to give Lawrence some points here for not acting like a horror movie uh, racial stereotype, but I do have to say, dude picked the wrong moment to go and look for his boy Chewy, man. Lawrence gives it a good go, and uh, he does manage to stab Jason after being frightened by a freezer full of dubiously aged meat. That's all I'm going to say. But um, after he stabs Jason, Lawrence takes off and starts running for his life. And all I've got to say, dude, is the golden rule of running away, especially for Jason, zigzag, motherfucker, zigzag. God damn. <laughs> he is just running straight on, and Jason brings an axe back and hurls that motherfucker like he just won season 10 of the Lumberjack Olympics. And he takes yeah. Lawrence full in the back. Now, while the rest of Lawrence's friends are in the house, what they waited out. Well, he screams bloody murder. I mean, he's actually screaming for help. And those people are just hanging out in the house going, I wonder if we should go help him. I wonder what's happening. Maybe Jason's gutting him. Yeah, he actually is. Because Jason comes along and body slams the god dang axe right through Lawrence's back and out his chest. I mean, Christ. Austin La Vista, Lawrence, I salute you, man. You went out like a champ, I guess. Dude, that axe throw was awesome. I, I really I really liked how Mears just performed that. I get the impression there are some that wouldn't have known how to throw that properly or something. Well, you know what I mean? That, but he actually slowed down and, and he did it just like you're saying. One of those people in competition. Yeah, and he brings it back like that. Think about the effects because he had to come forward. I don't know if he actually threw it or not, but it looks like uh, they don't look like you have a cut there and it goes seamlessly into the CG axe before we get back to real axe in Lawrence's back. It's great. It's a great shot in the film. It's iconic. So, totally, totally. <laughs> that that actually was just awesome in general. But I really like I really like the way that they they filmed that and that and that thud <laughs> as the axe <laughs> severed his spine. <laughs> but now we have to talk about stupendous Brie. And yes, I'm calling her stupendous Brie. <laughs> Is corpse number ten? Jason picked her up and shoved her back first into some deer antlers that were hanging on the wall, or perhaps even welded onto the wall, or as as well, or I, I don't know. Well, all I know is that somehow those antlers were able to hold her, hold up the weight of stupendous Brie. I don't know how that worked, but it did. And if that did not kill her, then Trent firing three rounds into her back through the door like a pussy firing a gun, it, it was a, it was an okay kill. Uh, nothing to write home about, though. Uh, why don't you tell us about corpse number 11, Dark Lord? Well, looky here. Bree's dead, but the cops have finally showed up. How nice. Officer Brack rolls up with his lights on and half a donut hanging out his ass before he comes comes on up to the door as chill as could be. He knocks on the door. <laughs> Why is the donut hanging out of his ass? I mean, that's I that's the wrong. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I, 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 I've heard of I've heard of people shoving like pills and stuff up there, but I don't think a donut could be eaten very well that way. Hey, I'm just reporting on what happened in the film. If you go back and slow the film down, frame by frame, you can clearly see half a donut hanging out his ass. So it's there. Get the special, special, special edition half a donut director's cut version of the film, and you will see it. So, so uh, God damn, somebody's gonna go look for it. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> 
completely gone. <laughs> uh, Officer Rap, though, he comes on up to the door. He knocks, you know, you know, doing the standard cop thing and loudly proclaims to every killer. I mean, he's proclaiming it to killers two movies over that the police have now shown up. Now, Jenna and Clay run for the door to go see Officer Brack, and they get there just in time for Jason to pop down behind the slowest moving cop in show business. And I say that having watched the Halloween movies with some pretty freaking incompetent cops. Damn. Jason then... <laughs> Damn, that's low. That's a low yeah. blow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, you got to go low when guy's got a half a donut hanging out his ass. But anyway... <laughs> Shit. YouTube's not going to allow any of this on air, so we're just going for it, folks. Uh, Jason Dick gives Brack a little fireplace poker right through the eye and right through the fucking door. Holy shit balls. I mean, there's regular fucking, there's skull fucking, and then there's that. Uh, I, Jesus. I hope and pray for Brack's sake, even with that half a donut up his ass, that he died right there. Because you are going to have a hard fucking time living that one down at the precinct, Brack. Rolling in with a goddamn fire poker through your face, a door attached to it, and a donut hanging out of your ass. You are going to be the butt, see what I did there, of many jokes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's like, you can't use any of this. Keep going, man. Just his son, his son, <laughs> Brack's son is going to be having a hard time living that down. Oh, you're the fun. You're the son of that one. Yeah. No, yeah. no. <laughs> the the no. fire poker through the eye that was pretty burly, I must admit. Although, whether it was a fire poker or not is debatable. Uh, I thought it was an arrow and meant to homage Mrs. Voorhees killing Bill with, among other things, an arrow through the eye sticking him to the door. But that's just my take. Any thoughts on that? You know, I'm good with that, too. I mean, honestly, if that's an arrow, that kill is even more impressive. He fucking shoves, think about it. He fucking shoves an arrow through a man's skull and then through a door. An arrow. If you need a reason to run from this motherfucker, there's your reason. <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely i mean uh I, the the skull especially 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 this this whole area right here is pretty hard yeah <laughs> so i mean to shove an arrow through that with just your, the force of your hand you don't have the 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 bow to give it that force that that takes some strength that's that's some shit right there Absolutely. so corpse number 12 is the asshole trent he is impaled to the back with the machete and lifted up with the dull side against his sternum. That must have been some painful shit. But then he was impaled yet again onto the back of the tow truck as it drove away. <laughs> Let's be honest. All of us were laughing at that point watching Trent get <laughs> towed away on the tow truck. So. <laughs> totally. I know I was. So, uh, All right. The next kill, and I will say this one hurt, and it shows once and for all, if Friday the 13th is not a morality play. Jenna is the most genuinely good character in the movie. And for her trouble, Jenna gets a machete in her back and out of her chest. Fuck me. Jason, did you have to kill Danielle Panabaker? Go back and kill Trent again. We hate that fucking guy. Kill him two or three times. We're fine with that. But no, you had to kill Jenna. Not only that, he kills Jenna as Jenna let Clay and Whitney go before her to get out of the tunnel, and she helped them out. I mean, it's just sad. I mean, it's like Jenna is seriously, like, putting others before herself to help them out, and Jason's like, well, that's very nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was... That was messed up. We talked a little bit about that earlier. That 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 really messed me up having that happen. Uh, it 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 threw a whole wrench into my whole program of what I thought was going on with this movie. Absolutely. But that leaves us with a corpse count of fourteen. Um, and I think I think um, the 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 original creators had actually intended to have a kill count of thirteen, but I don't think they intended us to count Pamela Voorhees. Aha, but we did. So we have a count of 14. 
With all of the homages to get to the franchise in this film, I tend to want to view the final scene with Whitney getting pulled down into the lake as an homage uh, to the dream sequence ending. I think Jason is still hanging there uh, in that wood chipper, you know, because it, it showed him just kind of bouncing there like this, but it wasn't going into the chipper itself. Like, it couldn't pull him all the way in. Uh, but but again, that is just my vote. Uh, do you have an opinion on that before we go into final thoughts on this, Nip? You know, um... Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. You know, once you put that theory forward, you know, maybe he came out of the chipper, but I doubt it. You know, and we needed it. We needed, if we were truly going to pay homage to those first four films, we needed that, you know, dream sequence there with the with him coming up out of the water. So I, I like that idea. Uh, I really like what you're saying there. So I'm going to go with that. I like that ending. And I think it works pretty great. So cool. Good one, Mike. Nice call there, and I think that Countless Corpses will definitely put our stamp on that ending. So Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. So, final thoughts, everyone. Uh, that is Friday the 13th, 2009, and by our count, Jason has killed around 200 people over the course of the Friday the 13th movies. That's a big body count, folks. Um, now, while that's not pandemic-level material, for a man in his machete, that is a serious killing spree. So I will say that uh, I enjoyed this movie. And while parts of the movie took me out of nostalgic Friday the 13th, as I mentioned, I thought it worked as an updated entry in the franchise. I thought the writing, acting, and visual effects were good to excellent. And the little criticisms I have there, here and there are from a fan who has watched a lot of Friday the 13th this year. Since it's been 15 years since this movie was made, I'm guessing they decided not to make this a franchise and more's the pity. However, I'm guessing that that horror on the big screen has perhaps moved on from Jason for now. But that's all right, though, since I do know we can look forward to more of the story in new entries on the small screen. And Mike has talked about that in several of our previous uh, podcasts. I will say that I give this movie 4.5 out of 5 skulls for kills. And I will give it 4 out of 5 skulls for overall rating. Overall, it's a very fun movie to watch. Nice, nice. I can totally see that. That that that's an absolutely fair take. Um, if I may comment though, before I divulge my final thoughts, um, it was actually legal disputes over who owned the rights to making the movies and who created what or who was hired. Um, it was all a big mess that still is still hampering uh, making Crystal Lake the the small screen show you were talking about. Uh, people have been trying to make more Friday the 13th films for over a decade. And quite frankly, it is amazing that this one made it to the screen. You know, I hate that shit. I understand it. And I certainly want the right people to get credit and compensation for their work. That said, I worry that a lot of this is greed and corporate shenanigans. And that makes my ass twitch in a bad way. <laughs> what do you think about that? for our final trivia question. And what rom -com is this ass twitch I refer to from there, Mr. McCobb, Mike? That phrase is from the French chef Luc from the 1995 film French Kiss. That guy's ass twitches a lot. <laughs> Maybe it's trying to tell him something. I don't know. But I'll take that evil piece and I will gobble that shit down. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, uh, make, make sure... <laughs> Make sure you watch the evil purse piece first. It's, you're eating an evil piece based on ass switching. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right, all right. Damn it. I wish you'd have said that before. Oh, never mind. <laughs> dip it in the river. Dip it in the river sticks before you eat it. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> As for my final thoughts, I can agree that this is different from the classics. But like Mike said uh, about the piano in the Voorhees house looking like it was from another century, so were those classic films. In my opinion, they did the best modernization of the franchise while paying mad respects to the film that came before. I don't honestly know how this could have been done better uh, beyond minor nitpicking. Uh, to tell the truth, I would point to the 2009 reboot as an example of how to reboot a franchise with respect. As for the kills, I thought they were fairly decent. I think I can match your 4.5 out of 5 skulls for the kills. And I'm going to go 4.5 out of 5 skulls for the film, too. Bam! Cool. Awesome. Awesome. And I think we're, it looks like we're pretty darn close on our scores there. So, very good. Very good. Um, so, thank you so much for watching, everyone. This one has been fun, and I can't wait to see what we talk about next. Make sure you check out our other materials, such as Fellowship of the D20 and the Circle of the Seven Dice 
both of them TTRPG shows, tabletop role-playing game shows, for those of you who are up to date with your acronyms, that both Mike and I are a part of. Also, go get your Omen comics from the anyoneworld.com or Comicsology sites. Finally, if you're looking for some of my written work, you can pick up my novel, The Long Game, or my comic series, Opsick, over at asapimagination.com. So, kiddies, until next time, remember this. Fuck that raven and bust a cap at his ass before he can save it nevermore. We're out, everyone. Bye.